once you've created your wafer and gotten it all, all the chips in there all shiny and, and cool, the next thing you do, excuse me, is you cut that wafer up into the individual little chips. And I've got some examples here. So here's a wafer. Um, these are pretty small chips, so you may or may not be able to see, but, but each one has been cut apart. You can see some of them have been pulled off. And this is just like a rubbery piece of um, sticky stuff that keeps that wafer together so that the chips don't fly all over the place. And it's in a little carrier. Here's another one that has already been cut apart, and you can see it's all fluffy. <laughs> um, but each one of those tiny little elements in there is a computer chip. So they're all cut up, ready to go into the next step, which is to protect these little guys in a package. Um, they're very sensitive. These, everything you see that I'm using today is broken. It never worked. Um, because handling things like this would completely destroy these little guys. They're pretty sensitive. So you need to protect them. So you glue them into a package. And I have some examples here that hopefully this one's big enough that you can see. But you glue it down into something that's very strong and sturdy to protect that little chip inside. Um, this is a what's called a ceramic package, so it's you know it makes a kind of cool sound when you click on it, but it's very sturdy and very rigid. It's also very expensive. Um, the reason that you would use an expensive one is if you want to put it like near your car engine where it's really hot and plastic would melt, or if you want to put it in a nuclear power reactor, or if you want to send it into outer space, which actually is what this chip uh, was designed to do. Um, this chip is really neat. This was at a company I used to work for. This chip does amazing mathematical calculations in outer space, and it is impervious to radiation. We call it radiation hard. Because when you send these chips out, out past the atmosphere, they'll go through the Van Allen radiation belt, and all the little charged particles in that radiation belt will come right down and zap these guys and, and fry them. So we use really special secret techniques to make sure that they're protected against radiation so that they can go on beyond um, outside the universe and beyond what used to be planet Pluto. That's sad. Anyway, that's a different commentary <laughs> altogether. So the, the chip is inside the package, and you put a lid on it to protect it. Um, I have some plastic packages here. So here's a little one. These are more typical for iPads or for uh, cell phones, computers, things that don't have to go out into a harsh environment. You'll use a plastic package because it's a lot less expensive. Keep the cost down, remember. Here's a package. Here's kind of an interesting one where the um, little wires uh, poke out the sides instead of out the bottom. This is called a dip. Now, I'm not calling you a dip. This is called the dip. Dual inline package, so that's a different type of package. And they come again in all sizes. Here's some more ceramic ones. You can see different shapes and sizes. It's all up to you what you're going to do with these chips as to what package you want to, want to pick. And let me show you one if I can even see it. It is so small that, look at this one, it's fitting, you know, tiny, tiny in the palm of my hand and, uh, you know, like on, the, on your fingertip. Now, clearly, there's not as many transistors inside this package as there would be, you know, in this great big guy. But still, that's pretty phenomenal. So the package protects it from the outside world. The next thing that you need to do is you need to connect the edge of that chip to these little gold shelves, if you like, because these little shelves connect to the outside world on these, they're called pins. These are like little wires that poke out. That's how you're gonna get all that electricity in and out of the chip. You're gonna send electricity in on one of these wires. It's gonna connect to the shelf. Tiny, tiny gold wires connect to the chip. And then the electricity is gonna go around and around. You're gonna do things with it. And then the electricity is gonna come out on one of the other pins. And I have a picture of that coming up. So that's a really important part of connecting the chip so that the information can get in and out of it to the outside world. Here's the picture, and you can see in this diagram a little bit better where these wires are connecting from the, the little shelf down to the chip itself. Someone did ask me once, did you say gold, Karen? Like gold, real gold? I said, yeah, real gold. Wow, can I have some of your chips so I can go and recycle the gold and make some money? I'm like, well, you can, but they're so small, and the amount of gold in there really isn't worth your trouble. So don't get excited that you're going to get rich if you find old chips like I do. <laughs> so that's how the chip connects to the outside world. The next step is to take that chip, put it on a machine, test it, and 
uh, make sure that everything is going to work because you don't want to go and build a product that has a chip that's going to fail in it. Um, and I want to show you something else too that's kind of phenomenal. You can actually test these chips with microscopic probes. There's a little tiny wire on there um, that you can touch down onto the chip or, or even when it's still on the wafer, you can touch it here and just test it. So um, all of the equipment here is highly expensive and highly technical and again that's the reason why we continue to want to make the chips cheaper because this stuff costs a lot. But isn't that cool? I, I, I wish you could see this up close because it's, it's pretty awesome. All right, so you run the test and guess what? Any chips that don't work, you throw them away. It's really not economically feasible to recycle the materials once you've layered all that stuff and put it all together. So the chips that go by the wayside, they're just scrap. So that's a y yet another reason, especially in today's um, world of, of environmental awareness. You know, we don't want to make mistakes as we're building these because we really don't want to throw them away. And then finally, you take the chips and you put them into what we call a board. So this green thing, if you've ever looked in the back of a computer or if something you've dropped something on the floor and it broke open, you'll see these green um, boards. They're called circuit boards, printed circuit boards, PCB, and they are what will house the individual chips. So on here you can see how all of the chips are placed. They're actually connected on the back with more wires. So it's kind of like when we built the chip and we connected all, we're gonna connect all the little things inside, we also have to connect the chips to each other. So let me show you some products. This is um, actually a video card. So for all of you gamers out there, you'll recognize this as probably like 10 years old and you wouldn't be caught dead with this in your computer. But uh, this video, this strictly processes the video to make your computer do awesome kinds of things. There's a video I, uh, uh, card. I also wanna show you something neat. We talked about how the chips can be big and this is an Intel chip. It was called Itanium. It's, it's a few years old. But look at how enormous this chip is. Um, it's you know, bigger than my finger. This is an incredible microprocessor that they built. Um, these two little chips over here are used just to, to save data, just to store data temporarily. Um, the interesting thing about these chips is when you get so much electricity floating around in there, they get really hot. And so what Intel had to do for this particular chip is they had to put it in a little case, you can see the case, and put a heat sink on the top. This is like a car radiator on top of this thing because it generated so much heat out of that little square of silicon. Look, caution, hot surface. Um, so th when I took this apart, it was very, very difficult to take apart. You know, I was kind of amazed to see that those little three pieces of silicon could generate so much heat that I needed like a car radiator to cool them down. So, you know, that, that brings me to something that's really important. Not only do we want to save costs, but we need to reduce the amount of power that these things are using because they'll burn you because this is big and because it uses a lot of energy in the world. We really want things to last long and, and use less power, um, help sustainability in, in planet Earth. You know, maybe someday when someone watches this video in 10 years, they'll say, yeah, we solved that problem and we don't worry about global warming anymore. That'd be pretty cool. So that is kind of an amazing thing. Here is, here is a disk drive. So if you hear about your hard disk, this is what it looks like. That's the big disk itself. But look on the back. There are all the chips, and you can see the green printed circuit board that they're all put on and then connected together. So that's what a disk drive looks like. Let me show you something that I think is, is a little more visually uh, helpful. This was a thermostat, automatic thermostat in my house. So you can tell what happens to things that break in my house. Um, we take them apart. <laughs> it's cool, it's like dissecting, but there's no blood and there's no guts. It's really neat, so you can pull all this stuff apart. So look on the back and you can see right there a capacitor. You can see right here, he's kind of smooshed down, right there a transistor, and you can see right here resistors. So these are the individual parts that made up this thermostat. And what engineers have done over the years is then to take these kinds of things that are big and combine them into chips so that they can have much smaller thermostats. So the thermostat that I have on my wall now is at least half this size. Um, things keep getting smaller, smaller, smaller. So that's a kind of a cool thing. Um, oh, let me show you this. This is kind of neat. Here's a video camera. And thanks to my dear colleague and friend, Pamela, 
she took this apart. She likes to dissect stuff too. <laughs> so she took this apart when her video camera broke and you can see again, green circuit board in there with little chips on it. Another circuit board with little chips all put together into a video camera or she dissected her digital camera. Look at that. Okay, so imagine, remember there's little chips in here. They've gotten so small, these little guys, you can't really even see them anymore like you could in that thermostat. But that's why this digital camera is so lightweight. Very, very small. That's the, the screen itself that's taking up much more space than the chips. Oh, this, here's a fun one. Here's a fun one. My first cell phone. This was like the coolest thing ever. Probably cost me a fortune. You know, it flipped down. Flip up the antenna. Yeah, that was really hot stuff, and now I'm embarrassed. But inside, again, you can see the circuit boards. And these chips are still pretty small, so even though this is old technology, we've advanced quite a bit, but not as much as, say, you know, this cell phone that has tiny, tiny, tiny parts in it. And uh, you can see, again, Moore's Law in action. Oh, finally, hey, this was cool too. Want to see what an iPod looks like inside? It's basically that big, that's the big disc. That's what, where all of your uh, music is stored. That's just storage for, for music and stuff. Look at all the little chips in there. Pretty neat, huh? So that's uh, the heart of an iPod. Boy, it, the, that was kind of an expensive broken iPod, but it's still cool anyway. So all of these things come together on the printed circuit boards into the electronic products and you put them in your phone, you put them in your computer, and then you're off to sell an amazing amount of electronic products and make a lot of money.